Hello everyone and welcome to another Worldly Repeating Beat video. Today I'm going to be showcasing fights against champions. Yes, champions. Now there's been a, a little bit of <coughs> comments and stuff going back um, on the previous videos, particularly that one where I fought Gil, and uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to lay some stuff to rest with this video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So first up is Nalgrimmer, and I actually have a couple fights with Nalgrimmer recorded. I'm only going to use the first one because the second one he decides to call it quits after a short time in just because it is going to take a long time to fight him, so that's just the end of it. Now the first thing to note right off the bat is that unlike with that fight with Gil, uh, now Grimir apparently has full audacity and other traits optimized and stuff like that because I hit about half as hard against him as I do against Gil. I, against Gil I could hit 1k crits and devastates with uh, black speech and with shield bash and against now I'm hitting 500s. So clearly quite a bit of a, a difference there in terms of the damage output which is going to be a, a bit of a problem and an issue if you're actually trying to you know win and survive and all that stuff. It also means it's much more likely that the champion could do what they they were doing back in Isengard which is there they could actually out heal your DPS with their bracing attack. Uh, fortunately, after having fought in the World Champions, I can now conclude that it's not properly possible for a champion to do that, excepting against a low-ranked war leader, which the low-ranked war leader is not going to be able to properly heal through the champ's DPS anyway, which is just an issue of the rank balance and all that kind of stuff. And actually, with update 10 coming soon, you know, maybe we'll see something to address the the disparity there between the low ranks and freeps, and because well, the freeps are going to be getting battlefield promotions, and we'll see how that works out. But hopefully, it means that they they won't they won't be afraid of giving monster players of all ranks just a, a nice little boost and pass, just to give them some extra firepower and utility survivability, extra strength really right off the bat so that they're not as gimped. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now I'm actually managing to, to do fairly well, and I'm, I'm slowly chipping away at him. Uh, the one thing that I do want to say about what he does that he does very effectively is he he's very good about using his bubbles when he has bracing attack ready to fire so that he can actually get a decent amount of healing done while that bubbles up. So the bubble will absorb his damage, he hits his bracing attack, and his morale goes up. And you can see that just right there with uh, he went from 8,000 to 10,000. And there a quick little look at the outposts just to see the distribution which you know, the outposts are actually pretty even. And the outposts, <clears throat> two things I want to say about them. Number one, I think that the boosts they give are too high. Number two, I think that the free peoples don't benefit as much from owning the outposts directly as monster players do because of the fact that they've already got a lot of mastery rating available to them. So the extra mastery from the outposts, it helps, but a lot of it gets eaten up by diminishing returns, particularly when you look at that third and that fourth outpost. Uh, the real big benefit for them is denying the monsters having those outposts because the monsters get a lot more damage out of it than they do. And keeping them from having that damage really makes things uh, a lot easier for, for them. <laughs> Whereas for monsters, you can survive not having a whole lot of outposts, but the more outposts you have, you really see a significant boost in monster damage from having outposts. And that's mostly just because they don't have as much mastery rating as Freeps do, whereas Freeps, uh, they, they can be pretty bloated in terms of how much mastery they actually have. So that's just my two cents on that. Uh, I still think that they do give bonuses that are a bit too high, but it's not as important as you might consider for the Free Peoples. Now those three creeps have joined into the fray, and uh, the Freeps in the background have also decided to jump in. Uh, Daisy's back there going after the minstrel, and the Lord Master took a shot at me, and, and uh, <clears throat> now Grimmer, he, he switched off of me and onto the other guy, so I went ahead and left him alone. And uh, so I decided, you know, the Lord Master's going at me, I'll go after the Lord Master and we'll just see what goes, but uh, the minstrel's also going to jump in here. And uh, 
pretty soon uh, the entire free parade rolls in. There we go, Eoblod. So they're all here now. Uh, they had just been a bit further north near Orc Camp, and they come south. And uh, now it's stun, focus, fire, death. And down I go. Alright, so the next up is Chomsky. And to start this fight off, I get up from being knocked down by the Warden there. So it is Champion versus War Leader with a Warden in the background. And so here we go, I'm dropping my banners, and I am going to stay in Brawler's Dance for the time being. But here we go, Pounceable shows up, and so does Tail Mage, who Tail is my favoriteest ward in the Etmores. No jokes about it, I like Tail a lot. I gave him biscuits and he kills things for me. We have a, a great working relationship going on. <laughs> but uh, the wargs are going to focus on Gearoid, and I decide to stay on Chomsky. And the nice thing about what happens here is that after these wargs finish off the warden, they actually leave uh, the champion alone, and the two of us manage to have a decent one versus one, you know, without any further interruptions or anything like that, which you know, I'm very grateful for. Plus, the wargs got fed on their warden anyway, and <laughs> it, it really helps for the wargs that, that it's a rank 12 and a rank 13 warg <laughs> that are out there. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get anything from Gearroid because apparently I didn't tap him with my AoE shouts, or I tapped him and it it ran out of time or whatever. Uh, but no worries. On to Chomsky, and you know, even with all that stuff, I actually managed to put a very nice dent into his morale bar. But uh, now he's going to be doing some pretty heavy bubbling, and this fight is going to get pretty stagnant very soon because I. In a little bit here, I'm going to switch into Commander Stance, and then it's going to turn into a Turtle versus Turtle fight. Uh, Chomsky, very apparent that he is Martial Champion trained. He's got a lot of blues. Uh, he has everything to improve his the magnitude of his bubbles, their, their cooldown, uh, improves his bracing attack as much as he can because he gets quite a bit of healing out of that. Uh, he is your quintessential fervor using martial champ traded champion who goes out there looking for 1v1s because the the martial tramp champion in fervor stance is a pretty easy way to actually go and do one versus ones and win for the most part i uh, didn't quite succeed in my attempt at my super double heal but eh, i didn't really need it now i am trying to put damage on him through that bubble and that's just a mistake uh, there are two major bubbles for the champions. One of them is on a shorter cooldown, and it's a lesser magnitude for how much morale is actually there. The other one, uh, it's a longer cooldown, but it is, I, I want to say, like four to 6,000 morale for that thing, and it takes a lot to actually get through it. So for that bubble, you never want to waste power trying to burn through it in a one versus one, especially as a war leader, where your damage output just isn't very good. It's far more effective to try to kite and avoid and stun them. I use Call the Shadow, hit them with Intimidating Shout, and then if they hit Sprint, that's when you nail them with Shield Bash Fracture at the same time so that they can't stun you with, uh, I forget the name of the skill, but that one that gets the buff when they hit Sprint so that it turns into a stun. And you know, just keep them at arm's length, let the bubble wear itself out, and try to deny them the ability to use Bracing Attack on you. But, uh, you know, even in Commander Stance, I'm actually putting pretty decent damage on him. Now, part of that is the Banner of Horror is down, but, you know, the, the thing I need to, to do, and I take a long time <laughs> with this fight just experimenting, trying to figure out what's going on and everything, and what I need to be doing better, is I need to be disciplined about when I'm actually attacking him and not waste power shooting at bubbles and that goes for everyone but uh, conserve your your big attacks conserve your power for when the bubble goes down put a lot of damage on him throw, throw a nice big burst and spike of damage into them when that happens and then turtle up for the rest of it now obviously that only really works for the war leader uh, the Defiler doesn't really have any spike damage. I mean, as bad as the War Leader's damage tends to be, it's still better than the Defiler, who they're mostly going to win on using flies and damage reflect. Uh, 
but uh, for for the other classes they don't have the, the same healing capabilities as the war leader and the defiler do and they're not going to be able to uh, skip over bubbles and just wait them out the way that a war leader can where you can just say eh forget it I'm not going to attack now I'm just going to turtle up so you know, there are advantages and disadvantages for all the classes. Uh, I mean, for the ward, you can use disappear and just wait for the bubble to be gone, which could be helpful if you figure out the right one. But yeah, it's just the way things go. Now, I'm running low on power, and that's the, the other big thing about this matchup: is you do need to be careful about your power management, and that's going to decide a lot. Is just how much power are you wasting shooting at bubbles? And are you doing a good job of keeping your power available for when the bubble is down? And there we go, redeploying the Banner of Terror, Banner of Horror, um, and his bubble went right up. And now, you know, I'm just this is just demonstrating why you don't attack when they've got the bubble up, and especially at low power. Um, I've used up all the power that I had on me, I'm right down at the bottom of my pool, and I didn't accomplish anything. His bubble's gone, and I didn't even pop it. It actually ran out. Uh, that was actually the weaker bubble because it didn't last as long, but because of the fact that I didn't have a whole lot of power and I'm in commander stance, I wasn't even able to properly pop that bubble and get through him. So it would have been better for me to have not bothered attacking and just gone ahead and waited it out. There we go with the stun. And uh, Chomsky, he really likes his stuns. He uses them pretty much every chance that he can. I. That could be effective if you've got plenty of burst damage and you're actually hitting your target very hard and doing a good job of actually putting them down. Uh, <clears throat> instead, you know, I guess the war leader. It's better if they're if your target is not dying really quickly. You're not likely to take out, you know, more many thousands of morale when they're stunned like that, and prevent them from escaping. It's better to be tactical about your applications of your stuns so that you can get more out of them and get them when you really need them. So, and for instance, that's what I'm doing. Is For the most part, I tend to be a little bit more measured about using that shield bash. Uh, part of that is because I want to make better use of diminishing returns. The other part is just that shield bash is a power-hungry skill, and I don't have a whole lot of power to spare right now. Um, so I really don't want to be making tons and tons of use of it. Now, right now I've got him slowed because I got that crit, but I don't take advantage of this to kite him and just bubble around as that I stay in melee range, which is a mistake because I really don't gain anything. If you're going to you know, stay close up, then at least be inducting heals. Don't just be walking around doing some auto attacks because you're accomplishing really nothing. So either kite properly or just don't kite and turtle. But pick one or the other. Don't do that. <laughs> Alright, there we go. I've hit my power pot, and Quitters is off cooldown. I'm just about to be, so I should be able to hit that shortly, and I'm going to have plenty of power available. And Banner of Horror is also ready to rock and roll, so here we go. Quitters, extra power. Banner of Horror, I should be hitting very shortly here, but he just bubbled. Uh, Banner of Terror, Banner of Horror both go down. And now I should just wait for him to run out of time on this bubble. It's not going to be super long, and then I can go back to hitting him with impunity. But, well, <laughs> fortunately he stuns me and slows me down and actually lets me accomplish just that. Uh, the other thing I should have done is I should have gone into Brawler's Stance, because getting extra damage right now, especially with him being lower on morale, me having a bit of extra power to use, that would be very effective to, to switch over, get the extra damage, get the improved cooldowns to use those shouts more, put more damage on him with the shouts. That would be the way to go about it. But I didn't, and so he hasn't lost a ton of morale in this particular endeavor. I, I've got him down 2,700. Uh, there looks like a morale pot just got used, so he's taking quite a bit of damage but I'm not putting enough on him and I'm running out of power once again and there goes another bubble. And look at that, if you'll notice in the chat, uh, Tailmange is actually locking off because I've taken too long in this fight and he's, he wasn't even hanging around anymore, he's, he's finished for the night and I'm still trying to finish the fight that he had joined. 
at the beginning. <laughs> and Chomsky has healed himself up quite a bit right there. And that was mostly just failure to properly stance dance or anything. Now, make, make no mistake, starting out with the two versus one, I did use up a lot of power. It was all focused on Chomsky, but it wasn't being used as effectively as it could have been. So, plus I wasn't in the one versus one mindset. I was in a two versus one mindset uh, where I knew I wasn't going to be able to attack the the warden and get anywhere. So I had to attack the champion and hope that I could get him killed in Bravo stance. Of course, then the wargs intervened and you know turned it into a one v one anyway. Alright, so right now what I'm doing is I'm trying to be very conservative with my power consumption. I want to get myself more power to use, get myself up over 2,000 so that I've got plenty to work with and I, so I can put on a proper burst. Because I realized after that last round that the, the big problem was that I didn't have enough power to actually sustain my attack and that I need to go into brawler stance. So my goal is keep some damage on him, keep his morale bar a bit lower but don't waste power, keep building up my pool, and uh, Quitters is ready to go, so I'll be able to use that fairly soon here to get even more power ready. And I, I want to wait one more minute so that I've got my power pot off cooldown. I'll go ahead and drop the Banner of Terror there, uh, hang on to the Banner of Horror for a little bit, but uh, the, the Terror is just to slow down his incoming damage, and uh, that's really the main purpose of putting it down, is just to slow down his damage so that I don't have to heal as much so that I can keep myself better. Uh, the one other nice thing is that because it lowers tactical mastery, it also lowers the outgoing healing, and I, I have to double check this, I think that tactical mastery might affect incoming healing. I would say no off the top of my head, but I think it might. But in either case, it does lower the amount of healing that he does get from his bracing attack and everything else. Uh, there went quitters, and went ahead and used that to get my boost of power. And you know, it's just handy to do that, so that you know, they're not healing as much, and it's just costing them more overall to do what they want to do. Now, the one thing that you probably have noticed is that Chomsky likes to use his stuns and then move to face his opponent's back, which there's really nothing wrong with that, it's perfectly fine. The only thing is that, because I am mouse turning, I just make sure when people are doing that to you that you get yourself set up so that as soon as you come out of that stun you will turn to face them and then that pretty much negates the fact that they did that in the first place. Against a keyboard turner it'd be effective just because they take a while to turn around and then you're beating on their back and get some extra time while they're stunned that you're attacking them while they can't block parry evade. Well, they can't evade. Block parry. <laughs> but uh, for, for the mouse turning, you know, just be disciplined about making sure you turn the right way and it's not going to be an issue. So, I'm up over 2,000, and shortly here I should be going into Baller Stance and going for a, a good burst on him and getting ready to put damage down. I've got that Banner of Horror down, but I don't seem to be switching stances right now. Uh, I guess I want to get some more morale first. And uh, there we go, I've got Call the Shadow, Intimidating Shout, and now I actually kite him for once, uh, which I think this is the only time I properly kite him in the whole fight. And so, you know, just keep him at, at bay with that, and it wears off, but I stun him immediately, and just continue to stay at a distance. And now would be the time to go ahead and put on Baller's stance. I need to, to make that switch very shortly here. Uh, he actually just went up in morale. I'm not sure if that was bracing or if that was a potion, but in either case, he went up. But I've got power. I, I need to be attacking, and I'm not, which is just a mistake on my part. I, I was experimenting, as I've said already a couple times, with how exactly to go about this whole thing. And you know, GV is not exactly the best place to experiment, but eh, it's what I have. I'll work with it. Uh, the one other thing that I should say is that I'm not built for soloing proper. I'm in my standard build, so I've got the improved bubble and improved res rather than having the empowering trait or damage boost or even better yet would be improved black speech for that dot because the damage over time man that is <laughs> such a great thing to have uh, I still don't have it I'm not gonna have it until I hit rank 11 
unless maybe I get uh, something out of a loot box. Actually, even then, I would probably send it to a different character. Uh, finally, I'm in Brawler's stance. Took me long enough to get there. But there goes his bubble, and yeah, this just means that I'm going to be wasting some power and time if I try to, to burst through it. I do actually go ahead and just keep him a little bit away, and I'm spending time healing myself up and trying to keep a little bit of distance between us, which this is a good idea for fighting champs, is keep your distance while in Brawler's stance when they've got that bubble up. Uh, keep him slowed as much as you can. Uh, I'm going ahead and dropping while well, I hit him with Menacing War, just to get the debuff going, and I didn't put down the Banner of Horrors, so now I'm going to put some more burst on him and see how much I can do, but at this point he decides the fight's over, uh, NPC showed up, and you know, who knows, but uh, he does decide to run away, um, I decide to keep going, and he will retreat behind the one-shotters, which gives me victory by default, I guess. <laughs> uh, if the fight were in a different location and I went longer, who knows what could have happened. But here, I find one more champion, just uh, near TR, but on that GV hill, and I attack. And this is only, a, looks like rank 5, it's not someone I recognize, they they don't have audacity, I mean look at the hits I'm putting on them, 108 with uh, an auto attack with no crits. I am just shredding through this champion's bar. Uh, that looked like it was a potion right there, so that's on cooldown now. And uh, 1425, that's a, that's a really nice crit for black speech actually, that's plenty of damage. And it looks like bracing just went off. And uh, there went Dire Need, so all the big heals just went off. And uh, initially when I saw that, I was just kind of flabbergasted that they were healing this much. And then I, my brain caught up and said, no wait, that was Dire Need. I'm making them use all their big cooldowns. Finish them. Kill the champ. <laughs> and you know, this is just the, the difference of <laughs> audacity versus not audacity. I hit literally twice as hard against this guy just because they don't have audacity. I, mean, I can blow through their bubble and all kinds of stuff like that. I, 962 with intimidating shout crit. I, it's just a world of difference the, being able to put down proper amounts of damage. And 400 health with a 1000 crit. Uh, <coughs> champ Salsa anybody? Because that's what's made out of that. But anyway, champions, it, it's a tough slog. But the key to beating them is power management and proper stance dancing. And if you do a good job with that, you know, keep your power managed, don't waste it on the bubble, and use it for switching between stances so that you're keeping yourself alive while they're bubbled and all that stuff, and then going into brawlers and really putting down the hurt when their bubbles are on cooldown and have already been used up, you're going to be very effective and you should be able to win that, as long as they are not able to get away from you. But anyway, that's all for this time. Good luck and have fun out there. Ugmog is out.